heading down the river Volkhov in northern Russia. Travelers meet with a lake called the Ilmin. At the northern entrance of the lake rises an archipelago of hills, turned by the rising water into little islands or peninsulas, known to the Norse as Holmar. The mouth of the river Volkhov has two distinctive parts, the western and the eastern. The western part, Poazeria, land along the lake, was divided by the river Veryasha. Since the 8th century, the area was densely settled by the agrarian Sopka culture. They are so named after their conical burial mounds, called Sopka. On the eastern part of the delta lies a hill, nowadays called Garadishe. This is believed to have been a powerful local stronghold, and perhaps even the first capital of the Rus. In the primary chronicle, it was written how the Slovenes built a city on the Ilmen, called Novgorod. In the year 862, they invited a Varangian chieftain named Rurik to come and rule over them. However, archaeology can prove that the modern city of Novgorod was not built until at least the middle of the 10th century. Instead, the city spoken of in the chronicle must have been Garadishe, and this can be attested to by the names. Novgorod means new city, whereas Garadishe means where there used to be a city. The latter name appeared around the same time that Novgorod took the spotlight, in the 11th century. To the Norse, the settlement appears to have been called Holmur or Holmgard. Translations differ. Gadur means a town, a castle or even a farm, basically any fortified compound. Holm is a small island, mostly known for the tradition of Holmgangur, a duel usually fought on a holm. Thus, the name can most accurately be translated as island compound. Since the settlement is seated on a hill rising above the rest of the terrain, on a peninsula occasionally turned into an island by floods, the name makes a lot of sense. Confusingly, the name Holmgard was later transferred to the modern city of Novgorod, and a lot of medieval chronicles and sagas forgot about Garadishe, thinking Novgorod was the original settlement built in 862. Of course, there is the possibility of Garadishe having been called Novgorod by the first settlers. It simply means new town, and then the name might have been transferred to the newer new town. So for the sake of convenience, it becomes more helpful to call Garadishe Holmgard and Novgorod by its traditional name. Additionally, Novgorod was likewise referred to as Nygarthur by the Norse, so we know that there was a differentiation between the settlements. It was only in the early 9th century that southern Slavs, calling themselves Slovene, migrated into Lake Ilmen. They were most likely attracted to the lucrative trade network going on between the Baltic and Caspian Seas, running through Lake Ladiga in the north and into the Great Volga River in the east. The Phoenix had already maintained market settlements on the Ladiga, most prominently the city of Aldeguborg, mostly populated and later entirely controlled by the Norse. The Slovenes likely wanted to tap into this market. The heterogeneity of the region can be attested to by modern genetic studies. The traditional population of the modern Novgorod district are genetically distinct from northern and southern Russians, being a mix of Finnic, Baltic and Slavic origins. During the 16th century there were the population efforts, but the ethnic population appears largely unaffected. Holmgard was constructed on a strategic location, a hill on the eastern bank of the Volkhov, from whence they could control river traffic. It was situated right between two tributaries, the Shilatok and the Volkhovets, turning it into a real Holmur. The hill was prepared by making its slope to the river more steep, making it harder to scale for potential enemies, and on the north and east side they dug a 4.5 meter deep ditch. The excavated dirt was most likely used for construction, and here was discovered the remnants of a wooden rampart. The settled area covered at least 4 hectares, making it one of the biggest known in the region. The fortified elevation was inhabited by the ruling elite, and the low ground, often flooded, by craftsmen, enclosures for livestock, and carpenters which serviced and repaired boats. Basically, it was a settlement entirely made for the river trade network, controlling it, taxing it, servicing it, and partaking in it. In addition, Holmgard was surrounded by a series of unfortified, probably agrarian settlements. Findings of iron plows and other agricultural implements at northern Holope Garadok indicates a presence of Scandinavian settlers working on freshly cleared forest. And Holmgard's importance on the trade route can be attested to by findings of silver derhum from the Abbasid Caliphate. These coins are numerous on all locations connected to the eastern trade route. 
there are also coins from the 8th century, indicating that the settlement might be older than believed. It stands on a hill of loam and sand, where wood could not be preserved except in a small section of the promontory. The 1.5 meter thick layer of the prince's residence has been disturbed by hundreds of years of posthumous construction. Archaeologists have struggled at finding remnants of buildings, which has also made it difficult to discover who built them. In Aldegibori, archaeologists have been able to learn that it was first settled by Finns, then Norse, and finally Slavs, thanks to remnants of buildings and their features. But it's not possible at Holmgard. Anyway, the settlement was an important trade and handicraft center. International trade is testified by Oriental and Byzantine coins, rock crystal and Cornelian beads. From the west they got glass beads, Friesland combs, walnuts and amber. Exports would have included jewelry, wax, pelts and slaves. Most of the urban inhabitants were craftsmen. Findings of crucibles, molds and production waste attest to bronze work. Combs were made from bone and antler. Jewelers worked gold into thin wires. These occupations might have been combined with agriculture, fishing and hunting. The Norse seem to have taken an interest in the city in the first half of the 9th century. Findings of Scandinavian artifacts are abundant. They include jewelry and dress ornaments, both for men and women, gaming pieces like a chessboard cover, which indicates how the upper classes spent their time, weaponry and a horse bridle. One interesting find is a dragon's head. It's not from a real dragon, it's made of metal. <laughs> there is no other like it in Eastern Europe, but similar ones have been found at Birka and Uppsala in Sweden, and on Gotland. Dragons were heavily associated with ships, so it is believed by scholars that the dragon heads may have been part of ship models now lost to time, or maybe that they harbor the same magical energies as the figureheads of ships. The dragon would essentially be an avatar of the vessel. Another finding unique to Rus is a silver pendant of the profile of a walking woman in a long dress. It appears similar to findings from Birka, and though some have interpreted it as a Valkyrie pendant, it bears no such signs, and is rather an attestment to the role of powerful women in the Nordic upper class. There is also the finding of a bronze bridal mount. These were very often found in the possession of Norse nobility. They have been found in ship burials in Norway, grave mounts in Sweden and Gotland, and also in Rus at Gnostava and Sopruti. Obviously, they were an important status symbol. The horse being, of course, an important symbol of status and power. Norse items of culture are incredibly important in Holmgard. Very prominent are twisted iron torques of the Tors hammer. The most important religious items are two amulets with runic inscriptions. The first one is made of bronze and inscribed in older Futhark, with a text dedicated to the god Tyr and his protective power. This amulet appears to have been used for a long time, and is believed to have been made in Scandinavia. The second amulet is written in younger Futhark, and apparently contains a magical invocation, Tarnisk ter eigi ur, may you not lack man's power, possibly a blessing for the bedroom. All in all, the variety of Scandinavian artifacts at Holmgard attests not only to the presence of individual merchants and warriors, but entire families of affluence and prestige. These findings make it clear that Scandinavians inhabited Holmgard from the early days, as merchants, warriors and craftsmen. However, it is uncertain if they controlled it as they did Aldegiborg. There are several clues indicating that Slavs maintained military control and made up the majority population. Iron arrowheads are incredibly common at this site. They include both socketed and tanged types. The socketed ones are the most prominent at Holmgard. Socketed arrowheads have a hollow body allowing the shaft to be inserted, whereas tanged ones have a thin metal bit pierced into the shaft itself. The former ones are regarded as uncommon among the nomads, Balts and Finno-Ugrians, being instead of a Slavic type, specifically West Slavonic. The prominence of these socketed, triangular arrowheads both indicates a heavy military presence and a strong Slavonic one. More common than arrowheads are findings of pottery. Parts of this style are analogous to findings from other Slavic settlements in the region. But interestingly, like the arrowheads, they resemble the pottery of the West Baltic Slavs. Another interesting find are bread baking ovens, which have been identified as distinctively Slavic. Again, they appear to be of a style constructed in the Western Baltic, in Stettin and Gdansk. The findings of arrowheads, pottery and ovens indicate a strong connection between Northern Rus and the Slavs of the Western Baltic. Perhaps it was only trade. Rus traders were so prominent in Moravia 
as to have a market named Rutsara Marcha after them. Interestingly, the Rus in this region were sometimes called Rugis. The Rugians were an ancient tribe inhabiting ancient Pomerania, so perhaps there is a connection between the Rugians, the West Baltic Slavs and the Rus. The Western Slavs were very much involved in maritime trade and raiding, frequently interacted with Vikings, so perhaps they migrated on a large scale into Northern Rus. Since Holmgard is sometimes regarded as the first capital of the Rus, as can be speculated upon based on some archaeology, perhaps its rulers were actually Western Slavs. Whence? Some have raised the possibility of the Finnish word for Russians, Venie, as being related to the Wens. Perhaps Rurik, the mythical founder described in the primary chronicle, who settled on Ilmen, was actually a Wend. The name has been speculated upon as possibly being Wendish. It is mentioned how he and his brothers were invited from across the sea, from among the Varangians. The tribes of Varangians given as examples are Swedes, Gotlanders, Normans and English. The presence of Normans and Angles are glaring. Norman was originally a Frankish catch-all term for Norsemen, derived from the Latin Nordmanus, which later came to meet the Norsemen who settled down in northern Francia, Normandy. Before the Normans it was called Neustria. By the time of the Chronicle, they spoke French. By English, the author meant the people we call Anglo-Saxons. They were a Germanic tribe, but are not traditionally understood as Norse. So by Varangian, did the author mean Norse people? Or simply Germanic people? Or maybe it meant all of these seafaring groups? Maybe it included the Wends? This theory is very old, going so far as to predate the controversial Normanist debate. In 1549, an advisor at the Muscovite court named Sigismund Heberstein theorized that it wasn't Varangians who had been invited to rule over Rus, but Wagrians. He also claimed that the Baltic was called the Warigan or Wagrian Sea. The Wagrians were a tribe of Wends living in Pomerania. However, Herberstein did not entirely dismiss the origins of the Rus rulers as either Swedes or Danes, or Prussians, and he may have conflated Wagrian with Varangian. But it seems convenient and highlights again how vague this period is. Most fascinating to me is that trade with the Moravian Slavs might have brought early literacy to the Rus, before they became Christian. In Holmgard, a slate wall was found with several lines and letters. It can be dated to the second quarter of the 10th century, no later than the mid. Apparently, the letters H and J can be discerned in the upper part of the object. Both are from the Cyrillic alphabet. Other findings of Cyrillic scripture predating Christianity can be found across Rus from the 10th century. Most likely, it was imported from the Christian state of Great Moravia. When it collapsed, its liturgical tradition spread to Bulgaria, which then heavily influenced the literary tradition of the Christian Rus. Many popular Russian names were brought in from Bulgaria, including Vladimir, the oldest known holder of which being Vladimir Rashate, who died in 893. Some Normanists today believe Vladimir to have originated from the Norse Valdemar, which is false. There are also findings of birch bark containing written Slavic text, but as far as I know, there's none dating to before the 11th century. They have most likely eroded over time. It appears as though the original language spoken around Novgorod was West Slavic. The language on the birch bark findings bear more Western Slavic than Eastern Slavic features, such as retaining Proto-Slavic features absent in Eastern. The West Slavic origins of the Novgorod language were retained for several hundred years. In the 18th century, a text called Pantographia listed all the world's known alphabets. It included the Lord's Prayer in the language of Nova Sembla, a region colonized by Novgorod during the Middle Ages. The language of the prayer bears a resemblance to the other West Slavic prayers in the book, like Polish. The language and bits of the prayer are likewise shown on this early 18th century map of all European languages. The West Slavic origins of the Novgorod population can also be attested to via genetic studies. A study from 2017 discovered that the native Novgorodians are genetically similar to Poles from the Vistula Basin, indicating a West Slavic source of migration. So in the end, archaeological, genetic and linguistic evidence points to a strong Wendish presence at Holmgard and the entire Novgorod region and their eventual rise to dominance. Thus, it is possible that they were the original founders of the Rus state and that Scandinavians, though prominent, 
were subservient to them. Influential? Of course. But you can be influential without being the ruler or founder, of which there may have been several. The Primary Chronicle also makes the following very confusing statement. It is after these Varangians that the Novgorodian lands became the land of the Rus. The Novgorodians are now Varangian stock, whereas they were formerly Slavic. Maybe my translation is faulty. Varangian could be Wagrian, and Slav could be Slovene. The specific tribe of Slavs believed to have initially settled Holmgard. There might also be signs of Scandinavian remnants in the Novgorodian DNA. The aforementioned study from 2017 discovered that the Novgorodians inherited haplogroup N3A3, also called N1C. The rulers of later Novgorod were discovered to be part of this lineage, and it's traditionally associated with the Finnic population. However, it is also widely present in Middle Sweden, the region most associated with trade and settlement in Rus. So a distant genetic link between the Norse and Novgorodians is not impossible. Archaeology points to Norse agricultural settlement in the region, and DNA proves that Scandinavians were buried there. But the study also shows that the Novgorod population is genetically distant from Scandinavians. Another piece of vital evidence pointing to Slavic control over Ilmen is the religious site of Perin, often ignored in Western sources. It is a sanctuary dedicated to the Slavic deity, Perun, located right next to Homgard on the opposite bank of the Volkhov. Specifically, on a peninsula, which historically was turned into an island by the two rivers, you could only reach it by boat. Nowadays it is often flooded during spring and returned to its island state. The sanctuary must have looked quite majestic back in those days, from the treeless surroundings the hill of the island, crowned by pine trees, rises above the flat riverbanks. It is no surprise that it was chosen as a sanctuary. One can imagine ancient travelers, merchants and warriors, muttering a prayer and tossing a coin into the Volkhov as they sailed past the rising grove. The act of tossing a coin into the river has been preserved into the modern day and is called the Tribute to Perun. The sanctuary consisted of a round, central elevation surrounded by a ditch in the shape of a flower, with eight petals. In each of the petals stood a fire pit. The petals also correspond to the cardinal and intercardinal points of the compass. Flowers were often dedicated to Perun, the evidence of which can be found in linguistics. The Iris Germanica is called Perunica, among southern Slavs. The flower appears in general to have been a symbol of the pagan Slavic cult, appearing on traditional folk embroidery. I also think the flower is similar to the sun, which would correlate to the wooden idols at the sanctuary facing east and the direction of the sun. But I haven't found anyone else discussing this. Apparently the non-blooming Perinic was considered the harbinger of death, so I guess there's a parallel of the blooming version representing life, the sun, etc. The sanctuary was open air, as no evidence has been found of wooden structures covering it. At the central elevation stood a wooden idol of Perun, facing east, and the rising of the sun. At the base of the idol stood a stone altar, where Perun would have been offered sacrifices. It appears as though at least some of the sacrifices were given in ceramic containers. One relevant finding is an urn containing seven horse teeth. The pots appear similar to those found at other Slavic monuments from the 10th and 11th centuries, being decorated with wavy lines and wide, straight stripes. The rituals observed at the site can be speculated upon based on known holiday traditions. In one such ritual, a shallow ditch was dug, a fire was lit, a goat slaughtered, and a horse driven through the ditch. It was discovered that oak was burned in the fire pits at Perin. This correlates to written sources, which mention how Perin is the god of thunder, and for him the unquenchable fire is contained from oak wood. Evidence points, however, to the fires only having been lit on holidays. Fires still remain an important part of Slavic rituals. It is said that if a priest allowed the fire to go out by accident, he was killed. Similar temples have been discovered at Arkona on Rügen, belonging to the Wends, and in the city of Kiev. They all bear similar patterns. A rising mound surrounded by water, with a religious idol facing east, the rising of the sun. This could mean that the site was either inspired by Wendish immigrants, or southern Slavs, who moved in during the 10th century. Or simply, ancient Slavic rites associated with the local Krivix. Neither is it known for certain when the sanctuary was first built, and if it was always dedicated to Perun. Written sources only mention an idol of Perun being erected there in 980, 
and this appears to be the idol discovered by archaeologists. What previous idol may have stood there previously is uncertain. The leading archaeologist, Vasily Sedov, said that the site could be dated no later than the 9th century, indicating that it's fairly old. Thus, it cannot be entirely ruled out that the Norsemen may have used the site to worship one of their gods, but it seems unlikely, and likelier that Perun had been the prime deity even before the idol erected in 980. After all, the site was called Perun. It's unlikely that they changed the name of a site already quite old, not to mention how well rooted the worship of Perun was among the local Novgorodians. As I mentioned, some of the traditions have survived to this day. As late as 1549, Perun was used as a war cry by the Novgorodians. In addition, it doesn't seem like any of the findings related to Scandinavian culthood were made in Rus, perhaps the amulet with the blessing for the bedroom. They seem to mostly have been brought in from Scandinavia, so Perun appears to have been the god of Rus, not Odin and Thor. If you wanted to worship those, you had to bring in your own idols. It seems as if the Norse had to pay him respects. The treaty between Rus and Byzantium from the early 10th century mentions how the Rus diplomats, most of whom were hired Norsemen, as indicated by their names, swore to uphold it on Perun and Volosh. Maybe the author didn't know the names of the Nordic gods and conflated them with their Slavic equivalent. You can potentially draw a parallel to Tacitus' Germania, in which the Germanic god Thor is seemingly referred to as Mars by the Roman author. Either way, the link between home god and Perun cannot be denied. They're virtually a stone's throw away from each other, or a boat's ride, you can say. The site being built so close to the royal powerhouse indicates that it was related to the state religion. Combined with the archaeological and genetic evidence, it points again to Slavs having been dominant at home god. It could of course be argued that maybe the rulers were Norse, but paid tribute to local gods to appease the locals, but this is mere speculation based on weak foundations and modern scholarly conventions. The positioning of Holmgard attests to it having been a large local powerhouse, and scattered pieces of evidence attest to it exerting its power abroad. Of note are the copper coins and lead seals belonging to Byzantine officials, indicating that Holmgard had diplomatic ties with Constantinople. This has led multiple historians to speculate that the settlement was the capital of a powerful local polity, and possibly the first capital of Rus, which in 860 was able to organize a 200-ship attack on Constantinople. In the 10th century, a Byzantine text called the Administrando Imperio wrote how Prince Sviatoslav of Rus had his seat of power at Ilmen, and that the Rus traveled south to Kiev to collect tribute, indicating indeed that Ilmen was a traditional center of power. When Rus history became better documented in the 11th century, it appears as though Lake Ilmen still maintained a lot of authority. Arab sources mention the Rus as living on an island or peninsula, which many believe to be Holmgard. When the river floods, the peninsula on which the fort is centered is turned into an island. It might have been the seat of the mysterious king of the Rus, described by Ahmad ibn Fadlan as follows. One of the customs of the king of the Rus is to have 400 men in his palace, who are the bravest of his companions, men upon whom he can count. These are the men who die when he dies, and allow themselves to be killed for him. Each of them has a slave girl who serves him, washes his head, and prepares everything that he eats or drinks. And then there is another slave girl, with whom he sleeps. These 400 men sit below the king's throne, which is immense and encrusted with the finest gems. Forty slave girls destined for his bed sit by him on the throne. Sometimes he has sex with one of them in front of his companions, whom we have just mentioned, without coming down from his throne. When he wants to perform his natural functions, he does so in a basin. If he wants to ride, his horse is led right up to the throne, and he mounts. If he wants to dismount, he has the horse move forward, so that he can get down directly on the throne. He has a lieutenant who commands his troops, fights his enemies, and represents him in dealings with his subjects. Whether Holmgard was the capital or not, something seems to have happened around the year 870. The neighboring city of Aldeguborg was burned down, and a fire started in the upper settlement of Holmgard. There are two vague, written incidents coinciding with this conflagration. One is the event in the primary chronicle, describing how the Varangians were expelled, and the Rus invited to rule over the city. Maybe this incident was based on the oral retellings of some political upheaval. Byzantine sources mentioned in 867 how they had successfully converted the Rus, 
and maintained a bishop and pastor among them. All evidence points to the Rus not converting until the late 10th century. Perhaps the conflagration was caused by religious tensions. Either way, Holmgard stood and would remain prominent. The turn between the 9th and 10th centuries marked an influx of immigrants and population growth. The lower residences were expanded, and this was when those aforementioned bread ovens were constructed, indicating an increased demand for food. Findings of Scandinavian items increased in this period, and new settlements cropped up in the region. Part of the reason behind this influx was the growing interest in trade with Byzantium to the south, and the downfall of the Volga trade route to the Caliphate. Religious tensions flared up again in the 980s. The primary chronicle documented how in 980, Vladimir the Great, still pagan at this point, appointed his uncle, Dobrynya, to rule over Ilmen. Dobrynya erected an idol of Perun at the Perun sanctuary. Nine years later, Vladimir converted to Christianity after failing at reforming the pagan cult. An archbishop was appointed to Ilmen and ordered the sanctuary destroyed. Archaeology can tell us quite well how the process occurred. The idol of Perun was cut down, dragged to the water, and sent down the river until it sunk. The base was left to rot. The fire pits were dug up and the ditch covered. Then, a church was erected in the sanctuary's stead, as was often done at old pagan sites. Old rituals were simply replaced by new ones. A main deity replaced by god, and minor gods replaced by saints. The destruction of Perrin caused a bit of controversy. Dobrynja had his house plundered and, and wife beat up by an angry mob. It was only with the help of a local warlord that the pagans were subdued and forcefully converted. No doubt, the process contributed to Ilmen's negative view of Kievan authority and dreams of autonomy and eventual independence. Holmgard did not see its downfall thanks to Kiev, however, nor Christianity. In the middle of the 10th century, around 960, construction began on the settlement which would become Novgorod. It was most likely built because Holmgard got too crowded, and power was transferred quite swiftly. The first written mention of Novgorod is most likely from the Byzantine, the Administrando Imperio, seemingly written in the 960s. It mentions Nemogardas as being the seat of Sviatoslav, son of Igor and prince of Rus. So early on, we can see that Novgorod was constructed through top-down effort to be used as a seat of power for the urban and aristocratic elite. Holmgard did not see its downfall from a great calamity, but simply a transfer of power. And this was a good thing. The power of Lake Ilmen only increased in the 11th century. At the behest of its boyars, the Kievan prince briefly moved his court there between 1000 and, and 1010. As the century progressed, Novgorod would grow into an independent republic and wrestle its independence from Kiev. As a conclusion, let's try to assemble a timeline to make some sort of sense or narrative of the scattered historical evidence. The area around Lake Ilmen was first settled in ancient times by Finns, the Slavic Kreviks, and the mysterious Swapka culture, believed to have been either Finns or Slavic. On an island in the Volkhov tributary leading into Lake Ilmen, the Slavs constructed a religious sanctuary called Perin, no later than in the 9th century. It is not known for certain when Holmgard was first constructed. Archaeological evidence points to the mid-9th century, which written sources claim was the point that Rurik established his stronghold at the site, from whence to rule over the local tribes and dominate the trade network. Findings of Byzantine coins indicate the presence of an embassy and that Holmgard was the seat of the mysterious Rus Kagan, at least from the mid-9th century onwards. But it cannot be discerned who first built Holmgard, Scandinavians or Slavs of whatever kind. In 862, the Rus Kaganate organized a 200-ship attack on Constantinople. After this, the Byzantines made an attempt to convert the Rus to Christianity. In 867, they reported success, having a bishop and pastor among the Rus. It appears to have caused religious tension, likely from the staunch pagans around the Perian sanctuary. Around 870, neighboring Aldegibor was burned down, and the fire started at Holmgard. At the dawn of the 10th century, Holmgard saw increased immigration of Scandinavian craftsmen, merchants, and warriors. Findings of Norse grain and iron plows indicates agricultural settlement. There was also immigration from West Baltic Slavs, and judging by findings of bread ovens and pottery, they formed the majority population. Findings of West Slavic arrowheads indicates their military dominance. 
they brought with them West Slavic scripture and language, which would later become the dominant tongue of the Novgorod district. Both Norse and Wends were drawn to the newly opened trade route with Byzantium, which replaced the Volga-based commerce to the Caspian Sea. By now, Rus had expanded to control southern Kiev, which became the seat of their king in 930. Around 950, the growth of Holmgard led to overpopulation, leading to the foundation of Novgorod, two kilometers up the Volkhov. However, Holmgard would remain the seat of the Novgorodian princess, well into the Middle Ages, and Novgorod likewise retained political authority, being a sister city of Kiev. In the 960s, Holmgard was the seat of Sviatoslav, prince of Rus. In 980, Vladimir of Kiev appointed his uncle, Dobrynya, to rule over Novgorod. At the Perun sanctuary, he erected an idol of Perun. Eight years later, Vladimir converted to Christianity and sent a bishop to convert Ilmen. Some Christians had already been established in the region, but the conversion faced opposition. The bishop had the sanctuary destroyed, and after an armed uprising, the pagans were quelled by military force and converted. Novgorod's sentiment towards Kiev was declining. In 1000, the boyars demanded that the prince move his court to Novgorod, which he did until 1010. As the 11th century progressed, Novgorod would grow and Holmgard declined, eventually turning into a palace for the prince and be known as Garadishe, the place where there was a town. In the early 12th century, it conquered Aldegiborg and became the sole mercantile power of the north, extending its authority across the Baltic Sea. Novgorodian merchants would have a quarter on the island of Gotland. Whilst Kiev would decline and fall to the Mongols, Novgorod would maintain its power and independence, fending off the horde with luck and diplomacy, and defeating the invading Swedes and Teutonic Knights. It wasn't until the rise of Muscovy and the reign of Ivan the Terrible that the city would be brought to its knees. All in all, the history of the Novgorod Republic is truly epic and worthy of its own future video. And it all began with the city of Holmgard and a cooperating population of local Finns, immigrant Slavs, Balts, and Scandinavians. If you enjoy the content I produce, please consider supporting me monetarily by becoming a channel member or patron over on Patreon. You'll find the necessary links in the description box below, in addition to the sources used for writing the video script.